name is Melissa Jeter, Librarian Specialist for the Art Tatum African American Resource Center, located in the Kent Branch of the Toledo Lucas County Public Library. Welcome to the Art Tatum African American Resource Center's Oral History Project, the Adrienne Cole Collection. Dr. Adrienne Cole was a local African American historian and educator who began collecting the stories of noteworthy Toledoans in the African American community. With this oral history project, the Art Tatum African American Resource Center honors her memory and her work. Join me and University of Toledo Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Willie McCather, as Toledo's very own African Americans share the stories of their lives. I'm Dr. Willie McCather. In this segment, we're pleased to welcome Gladys Glenn, the widow of deceased Tuskegee Airman Herbert Glenn Sr. Mrs. Glenn, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Mrs. Glenn, I know that you and your husband were married for 64 years in one day. A week. In one week. In one week. 64 years. 64 years. And you, mm -hmm. So you have a lots of memories to share. Yeah. Um, but before we share all those memories, I know that you moved to Toledo in 1946. Right. Um, but before we talk about uh, the entire 64 year range, let's talk about how the two of you met. Well, my folks moved from North Carolina, Clemens, to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And my husband was at Wilberforce, and if you took a government job, they would defer you from the service, armed services. Mm -hmm. So he took a job at the Norfolk Navy Yard and was working on battleships. And I had moved from North Carolina to Virginia. My folks moved there to go in business. Okay. And I had to go back to school because it was my senior year. Mm -hmm. And we moved in December of 42. Okay. And moved to uh, Norfolk. Okay, okay. Let me, let me go back now. But your husband was born in Kentucky, is that correct? Paducah. Paducah, Kentucky. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And he left from Paducah and moved went to Wilberforce. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. He got a scholarship to Wilberforce. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now what kind of scholarship did he get, do you, do you know? No. Okay, okay. I don't know. Okay, that's fine. But he could do everything. He did everything. <laughs> he did everything. I know he went to vocational high school. Okay. Uh -huh. He went to a vocational where they teach you how to do things with your hands. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So let's, let's go back. So then you were in Clemens. Clemens, North, North Carolina. Carolina. So you moved from? Clemens to Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And uh, my husband had left Wilberforce and also moved to Norfolk, Virginia to take a government job. And uh, we met one night at a USO dance. And uh, the rest is history. Of course, I was engaged when I met my husband. Uh oh, someone else. <laughs> but he was overseas in uh, medical corps. Okay, okay. And uh, we were just supposed to be going to dinner and to the movies, just casualty. I didn't want anything serious. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. But here we are, what, 60 something years later, and it got pretty <laughs> serious for <pretty> the. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So ultimately, the friendship turned into much more. Yes. Okay. Um, so then, what happened um, once once the relationship became serious? At what point did he join the service? Well, um, they finally caught up with him. Although he had this defense job, mm -hmm. but they wanted him in the service so they called him in for interviews and I don't know what kind of tests he took okay. but anyway they gave him a IQ and he scored so highly on the IQ they called him in and said you can join any service any service that you want to so he chose the Air Force okay now about what year was this uh, early 43 Early 43. Mm -hmm. Now, how mm -hmm. long had you all been dating at that point or together? Oh, about six months. Six months, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So he took the test, he mm -hmm. scores high on the IQ, mm -hmm. and then what happened? Uh, they told him he would have to go into service, but he could choose any branch of service that he wanted. 
Okay. So he chose the Air Force. Do you have a sense of why he chose the Air Force versus the Army, the Navy? Well, his brain was different from mine. He had like a mechanical brain. Okay. And um, he was smart. And maybe he knew what he was doing. I don't know, but it turned <laughs> out nice. Um, he wound up at uh, Keith LaField in Mississippi. Okay. And that's where they did their basic training. Okay. Mm hmm okay. Not basic, primary. Primary training. Primary, mm hmm Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then after, they were on a waiting list, and after so many months, and they were shipped into Tuskegee. Okay. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me go back. So while he's in Mississippi, uh -huh. um, did you have a chance to visit him in Mississippi? No. There was no accommodations for blacks whatsoever. There was no place to stay in. You couldn't eat. You couldn't do anything off the post. See, the uh, Air Force took care of you if you were on the post, but off the post you were on your own, and it was nothing for blacks. So he didn't want me to come under those conditions. Okay. So I never went. Never went. Did he ever talk about things or experiences he had um, while being in, while in Mississippi that oh, seemed yeah, unfair? Oh, yeah, they couldn't go in. The white guys could walk right across the highway and go in the Gulf of Mexico, but they couldn't. They had to go way down some little part to get into the Gulf. Did they really? <laughs> And it's right across the street. Really? Mm -hmm. okay. and, and obviously he served in a segregated unit? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything was segregated. Okay, okay. But despite that, though, he had a high IQ. Mm -hmm. He was very smart. Mm -hmm. um, so then what happened once he left Mississippi? Well, the... Um, they were at Tuskegee University. He had to live on campus, and he would, they would cram them. They have what you call cram courses, mm -hmm. and uh, they would study a half a day, and then they would fly a half a day. Okay, okay. And I had to stay off post, and uh, I was able to get a room with a really nice family, a doctor and his wife, and I shared the bathroom and the kitchen okay. with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now, as you're in um, Tuskegee as well, mm -hmm. um, how would you characterize race relations at that time in Tuskegee? It was awful. You couldn't try on no clothes. You couldn't try on no hats. Or, and you had to be off the street at 6 o'clock. Everybody? Every, all black. You had to be off the street. You had to be off the street time. at 6 o'clock. If you weren't off the street, they'd pick you up. The sun, if the sun went down and you were out, you were in trouble. Okay, okay. So it, I only went off a couple times. And the one time uh, we went in town, the little city of Tuskegee, and I was getting ready to go home because I was seven months pregnant and I was going to my home to have my son. Mm -hmm. And I had to get up and give my seat to a white man, and he took it. And you're seven months pregnant? I was seven months pregnant. Mm -hmm. Wow. So. You know, there, there's this, I, I want to deal with something real quick, because there's this sort of somewhat misconception mm -hmm. among some people mm -hmm. that for African Americans that were fair-skinned, mm -hmm. they had a much easier time. There was little or no discrimination. Not me. They treated me like they did everybody else, all other blacks. How'd that make you feel? I mean, I know it's been a number of years, but that must have been well, heart you, you feel frustrated. You, you, I can't, you wonder why all of this hate and all these signs, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, it, was, it was terrible. Oh, but you were able to endure it though. And that's the, Pardon me? you were able to survive it and endure it. Oh, we were it. able to survive it, yes, because uh, my husband was fierce when they stopped the bus and asked me to get up. And I, I, we both said, now, 
it, it's nothing you can do because they will throw you out of the Air Force and probably been a fight and I probably lost my child. Mm -hmm. So we just didn't say anything. I got up. It didn't hurt me to stand up. Uh, if he was that low, uh, let him have the seat. So we stood up. We didn't say anything. But now, so, so your husband was on the bus with you? Yeah. Was he in his uni uniform? Yes. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. They, they act like you dirt. They didn't, re and they would just say anything to you. Whatever came out of their mind, they would say anything. Now, this particular incident, you know, I want to go back to that. So when you got up and when you were asked to give your seat up, uh -huh. um, did your husband say anything or did he sort of understand? No, I asked him, please, you know, don't say anything because in a situation like that, you can't win. You know, and I didn't want him to be thrown out, you, you know, out of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cadets. I didn't want him to be thrown out. Okay. And that's what they would have done. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. sure. If you would have said anything or tried to press charge, you couldn't win. You know, there are some people, younger people in particular, who would say well, he was a coward because he didn't fight. Oh, I think he was strong. Um, we survived it. We didn't like it. It wasn't right. But you can't, you can't win in a situation like that. All those people. All they know is prejudice and hate. They didn't have no respect for black people. Okay. At all. Well, the good, good thing we've moved beyond mm -hmm. most of that, at least. Thank goodness. Let's go back to your husband um, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, so, at what point um, did he decide to get out of the military? Did, did he ever go overseas and fight, or no? What was the no, he didn't go overseas. He was battle ready, but. Uh, he was a month away from graduation, okay. and the war ended in August. They shut down everything okay. immediately. Okay. Everything ceased. Okay. So um, they didn't get to march, but they were they had finished, you know, the courses. Okay, so he mm -hmm. had finished all the courses. Uh huh. Um, and he was trained as a pilot. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, he was ready, and. Uh, they were just fortunate the war ended because they were next to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. As soon as they graduated, they'd have been gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so what caused him not to go? I mean, he could have stayed in the military, but he got out. Yeah, he, he could have still stayed. They would have sent him to to Korea. Mm -hmm. But by me being pregnant, and he just decided to get out. Okay. Honorable discharge. Honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, when he did get out of the military. I know he was trained as a pilot, but mm -hmm. he was also a very talented man in other respects also. He was a carpenter yeah. and mm -hmm. what else other skill sets did, did your husband have? Well, he was a carpenter by trade. Um, he was a welder, a builder, a pilot. <laughs> and everywhere he would go to apply for a job, they would say, we don't hire blacks, you're overqualified. Okay, let me come back to that. So once he, he's discharged from the military, mm -hmm. where do you all move to from Tuskegee? To Toledo. You moved from Tuskegee then to Toledo. Mm -hmm. When you moved here, who did you live with? His sister. Okay. She had a duplex, and we moved in with them. Okay. What was his sister's name, and where did they Ms. live? Al Alma Campbell. Alma and Omri, Omri and Alma Campbell. Okay. They lived on Norwood, 500 block of Norwood. Okay. And we stayed with them for three months. And after that, the government had built some temporary apartments out at Scott Park. Mm -hmm. You know, on the, what campus is that over on Nebraska? Scott Park. Scott Park campus. Mm -hmm. And we learned to skate on that pond out there. I skate my children. <laughs> we did. Uh -huh. Okay. That was in our backyard, that pond out there. Okay. And uh, they tore those apartments down, I guess, in about 10 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. But those are houses that were put up by the government. Yes. Though. 
Uh -huh. Temporary housing units. Temporary housing units. Were they set up for veterans or or veterans for veterans? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you guys lived mm -hmm. there for a while. Yes. Okay. We stayed there. Oh, a year or so. Did you? Mm-hmm. Okay. They had new refrigerators and oh, it was really nice. Okay. From coming from, you know, Tuskegee. Tuskegee. Everything yeah. was new, and they were lovely. Okay, good. Mm hmm Let me ask you, I, I mean, I imagine your husband must have felt good about his accomplishments. Was he proud of what he had achieved in Tuskegee? He never talked about himself. If you didn't know he was a Tuskegee Airman, he didn't talk about it. Really? Um, he never spoke of himself. He was always trying to help someone help else. Someone else, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about then what happened, um, the adjustment you made to, a, to Toledo in 1946. Oh, yes. Well, he came, we came here, and of course, he worked for his brother in law. He had a cartridge company, mm -hmm. and they haul uh, flour and cornmeal and sugar and stuff like that. Okay. And those bags were heavy. Okay. And he, he was so young, so he knew he didn't want to do that the rest of his life. Okay. So he tried to seek employment in his field. First he went to um, the airlines, and of course they said, we only hire one black out of a thousand. They told him that? Wow. They had all, they had tens of thousands of white pilots, but they only had about a thousand blacks. Well, who can wait that long? And they had their quota, so they were they had their quota. So they had stopped. So they're not taking them more. Mm -mm. Okay. So then he went to the housing. You can't get in the union. They don't hire blacks for that type of job. They pay too much. They 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 don't want blacks to make that kind of money. They just tell you. People would just tell him just straight yeah, out. Yeah, straight out. We don't hire blacks in that uh, field. Okay. <laughs> so what job did he? What, what what job did he ultimately wind up getting then? He finally got a job with the Transit Authority, and he started out driving the streetcars. And well, I guess a couple of years. He drove the streetcar, then they brought in buses to replace the streetcar, so he drove buses for a while. And uh, I want to stop you there. I want to make sure I, I got this and put it in the right sort of context. Mm -hmm. So here's a man who's a trained pilot, mm -hmm. um, a skilled carpenter, mm -hmm. many talents. Mm -hmm. um, when he leaves the military, in mm -hmm. 1946, mm -hmm. he comes to Toledo, and not to demean a job as a, a driver, but mm -hmm. he was qualified for much more than that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the best he could do. That's the best he could do. And then white people wouldn't ride with him. They would wait till a white driver came along <laughs> and ride. When the white driver, they won't ride with blacks. You couldn't go in the theater. If you did, you had to sit upstairs. You couldn't go in restaurants. Joe Lewis used to come here and play in our tournaments, mm -hmm. and he could not stay in the hotels and motels. He would have to stay out in the black community with friends or there was a couple of black people that had uh, motels. Sure, sure. He would stay out there. Couldn't eat in the nice restaurants. Okay. All right, so we're getting a little bit ahead, but I want to talk about that in just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, that all sort of relates to this notion of your adjustment yeah. or your welcome home, rather, yeah. uh, here in, here in mm -hmm. Toledo. Um, so your husband gets his first job. Um, when were you all able to move and get your first home? In 1950. 1950. Mm -hmm. and and they could, they wouldn't show you. Let's see, it was about four streets that you could purchase a house. Uh, the outer areas and everything, they wouldn't show you. Anything past Upton, you know, they wouldn't show you. They meant for you to be right in the middle of the ghetto, 
So real estates wouldn't show you no houses outside of three or four streets. So then you were sort of residentially segregated. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier about uh, restaurants, movie theaters. Mm -hmm. How easy was it for African Americans to go to any <laughs> restaurant? They would make you wait so long that you didn't want it. You know, they would just wait on everybody all around you. And you had to wait sometime, maybe 45 minutes, an hour, if they served you. Okay. Even White Tower, you couldn't go in White Tower and buy a hamburger unless you went around to the back. You go to the back. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll, I'll ask you the same question I asked you before. How could that have made you feel, but you know, but and even your husband, who had served his country, to come home and still be treated like worse than a second-class citizen. It makes you feel bad, but uh, they work, get laws changed. Um, it it was just awful the way they treated black people. You know, and what I, what I find interesting is that we sometimes think that kind of treatment only occurred in the South. It's all over. Okay. They hide it maybe a little bit in the North. <laughs> but down South, they tell you flat out, you know. But up here, they like, they sneak in. Okay. You walk away and your neck fall off. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, we have been a lot of places and uh, in the United States it's, it's segregation. Oh. How about how about going to the movie theater? Were there theaters you could go to here? Well yeah you could go but you had to sit upstairs. You couldn't sit down, you couldn't choose where you wanted to sit. They pushed you upstairs just like they did you know down south. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You couldn't you couldn't go to okay. the restaurants. So all wasn't always fair in Toledo. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's sort of change gears, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, how about church? Did you attend church when you, did you join a church yeah. when you arrived at Toledo? And so mm -hmm. what church did you join? We joined uh, uh, Warren Church, Warren Emmy African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1950. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And you, you've been there since? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, we built a new church, and uh, I was on the steward board when they voted to um, build the church, and, uh, and my husband, too. Our name is engraved on the church. Does it really? In gold. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your children. So you, you're married for 64 years. You have two sons. Mm -hmm. You have grandchildren? I have five grandchildren and ten great-grandchildren. Do you really? Mm-hmm. Now, and what are your son's names? Uh, my oldest son was named Herbert. Okay. And my youngest son is named Gary. Okay. And uh, Gary worked for Ohio Bell for 36 years, and he's retired, and he has his own business in Columbus. Okay. And Herbert worked for Libby One Ford, and they moved overseas, and um, I used to have my own business, and I retired, and I turned it over to my son and his wife here. Okay. Adult okay. foster care Adult home. Adult foster care home. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, mm -hmm. good. Um, so let me go back to your husband. What, how long did he work for the transit system? He worked for the transit authority about, uh, I think about 38 years. 38 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. But after about 15 years, he was able to get into the office. He was the first black uh, supervisor. Mm -hmm. And then he kept on working his way up. And when he retired, he was chief of the Transit Authority. Was he really? Mm hmm. Okay. And he's been retired 25 years, and they have never replaced 
him with a black person. Is that right? They always hire black. They don't think that. <laughs> Robert, I don't know. And they do have some people out there with, you know, part college sure. education, but sure. they will hire. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I know that your husband passed away July 31st, 2007. Mm -hmm. um, and he had attended a special um, recognition of Tuskegee Airmen in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about that um, invitation, about what the um, presentation was like. Well, when we were in Washington, the Blade, a staff writer from the Blade, called us long distance. And uh, we had just left the. Uh, um, dinner. We had dinner at the um, Library of Congress and uh, he was, that's the only time I ever saw him like get excited. He was so pleased to be be there and he had seen the president and got his autograph. Well the whole day was just fabulous. It was really, really nice. So the guy asked him how he felt and he said it was the greatest day of his life. Wow. Um, I thought he was going to say, <laughs> the greatest day of my life was when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure he felt that in his heart. <laughs> yeah, but he said that was the greatest day of his life, meeting the president and having those honors bestowed upon him. Wow. Mm -hmm. So he really, he really enjoyed it. We, we had a great time. Did you really? Yeah, they really, uh, it couldn't have been any better. Wow. It well, it sounds like he was a very humble man. Yeah, he was very humble. Um, very mm -hmm. hardworking man. Hardworking man. Good husband. Man. A good father. A good father. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that he took very good care of you, of course. Yes, very good care. We took care of each other. Okay. Um, he was wonderful to live with. Okay. He loved to travel. He liked to read. And I think golf was his first love. Because he was an avid golfer. Mm -hmm. But then again, you was also. You were mm -hmm. a good golfer also. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the, 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 the golf outings that you guys participated in. Oh, we played in golf outings all over Cleveland. We used to have what is called um, inner city matches with different cities. Mm -hmm. And we would go to Columbus one year. I mean, we go to Cleveland or Detroit, and then the next year they would come here. And back in 1950, uh, he and a group of people decided to form a golf club, mm -hmm. and they built a little golf club over on uh, Nebraska, the 500 block of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And um, you learn how to entertain yourself and we would play golf with couples, and if you lost, uh, you would have to treat the women <laughs> with dinner and bridge, and so we did things like that. In fact, I was going to ask you about the things you did socially. Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. golfing was obviously one of those important things right. that you all did. Who were some of the couples or, or people, individuals that you all golfed with? Well, some of the old Toledo ones were um, Howard and Ursie Anderson, uh, Hazel, uh, Stanley and Hazel Cowell, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morris. Oh, there's so many. Okay. I can't. I, uh, uh, Zeke Ward, Mr. and Mrs. Ward. Mm -hmm. It was about 50 couples. Oh, they really? That, mm-hmm, uh, got together and we would go to Adrian and Detroit, Cleveland, Dayton. We'd have what is called inner city matches mm -hmm. with them. One year we'd go there and one year we would come here. They would come here yeah. and uh, Joe Lewis would come and bring his brothers and oh, he would have like seven cars loads with them. Really? And one day, well, championship men, we had about 200 to play in our tournament. So in order to speed up the tournament, 
if you're on the par three and you're on the green, you have to stand aside and let the ones behind you, mm -hmm. you know, hit up. So I was playing in championship women. And so I was the first on the tee and I hit my ball up there, excuse me. Excuse me. And almost had a hole in one like that. I don't know why the ball didn't fall in. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe Lewis waited till I got there. He said, that's the way champs hit ball and gave me a hug. Did yes. he really? Mm -hmm. But, but you were telling me earlier that um, during that time when Joe Lewis would come to Toledo, uh -huh. he couldn't stay in a hotel. No. Mm -mm. They treat him like they did everybody else bad. Okay. Wow. Couldn't eat. That's just frightening. That's just it's just uh -huh. hard, to, hard to imagine. But 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 you're golfing with these other couples. At some point, I'm going to come back and ask you for lots more names of those couples. Yeah, I'm not a, right now, but I'll uh, I'll, I'll, come I'll back write to you. them down and I can be okay. able to think of them. But several. Okay. Several more couples. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So outside of golf, what other things did you all do socially? Well, we formed a bridge club, and. Uh, we played bridge, and if it was my term to play bridge, we would have uh, uh, dinner and then bridge okay. afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you went from sort of from house to house, house playing, to house. playing, playing mm -hmm. bridge. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So then yeah. that kind of comprised your social activities. And then, of course, being with two boys, I learned to love uh, basketball, football. They would take a vote. Now, you have three men in the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I wind up most of the time uh, doing what they wanted to do, and, and I learned to like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But but your love and what you were good at was golf. I remember seeing a number of yes. your trophies. So you were yeah. a good golfer, not I, average. You yeah, were good. I, I was very good. Yeah. Had I had um, a sponsor, I probably could have went on the tour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, we didn't have any money, but I was very good. Everybody told me I should be on the tour. Well, I, and I've seen all of your trophies, so mm -hmm. you have trophies to prove it. Yes, yes, very and I loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to go back to something that I, I think we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that we sort of discuss this. I know that your, your husband uh, was raised by a sister, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about that sister and what she meant to your husband. Well, she was a mother like to my husband. Uh, when his mother died, he was eight years old. Okay. And she was 15. And she took over the head of the house and kept them all together, you know, rather than breaking up the family. Mm -hmm. She kept them all together and, you know, like re reared them, make sure they stayed in school and um, they all went to college, they did well, okay. and um, after they left home, she went back to school and got her degree and then went on to get her master's degree and taught at the college there really for about 15 years before she passed. And what was her name? Pardon me? What was her name? Mrs. Mary Sled. Everybody called her Mrs. Sled. Mary Sled. Mm -hmm. And she married a professor of mathematics, and I think he had a lot to do with it, you know, okay. of her going back to school, because mm -hmm. he, he was just a jewel. Okay. And so she went back and got her master's and taught, too. But it sounds as though she was very influential yes. in your husband's upbringing oh, and, and yes. in his life. He loved her dearly. Uh, a lot of times uh, we would, in the one time, my husband's birthday, February 27th, mm -hmm. and he liked to travel, so every winter we would go on a cruise, and uh, we would always go see her when we came back, make sure she's okay, because he had died, her husband, mm -hmm. and uh, we would go down to see if she was okay. Are you still in touch with them then? Mm, oh, yeah. I talk to them about every day or every week. They call me and want to know if I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, no, you told me that your husband did so much for you and took such good care of you. How are you coping now after 64 years? 
Well, it was hard. The first four months mm -hmm. was really, really hard. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. So the doctor told me that I would have to, you mourn, and then you get over it. Mm -hmm. uh, that I was making myself sick. I lost 15 pounds. Did you? And um, so he put me on a special diet and took real good care of me until I got back on my feet. Mm -hmm. And so I went to counseling, and when I think about all the good times that we had and how blessed I was to, to have him, to give me the type of life that he gave me, uh, it, it like dried up my tears. Sure. And Marcy Kapter, when I was in Washington, and we talked, and uh, that's a congresswoman from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she sent me a little poem. It says, uh, do believe I'll never leave you. You will always be in my heart, and my soul will be near you, so we will never part. So I think he's with me. Well, we are, again, we are certainly proud that the two of you made Toledo your home. Oh, yeah, Toledo was good to us. Okay. Although, uh, when I think about how much better we could have lived had he been able to get a job as a pilot or a builder, or a welder, or all the things that he could do. Uh, but God blessed us anyway, and I'm grateful for the life that we had. But, but does it make you angry when you think yes, about it? Yes, it makes you angry when you think about how he was denied everything, but we still we still were blessed. Blessed. Mm -hmm. and you persevered. Uh, I, when I think about being invited to Washington, once I thought that was the greatest thing that ever happened to us. But then to get invited twice, that that's unbelievable with such humble beginnings. Now, what was the second time for? The inauguration. Uh, the president. first time was to get the medal, the gold medal. Mm -hmm and the second time was inauguration. Well, let, let me ask you real quickly, as we begin to, to wrap up here, mm -hmm. um, we now have a, a first African-American president of the United States, mm -hmm. President Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever think you'd see that happen? No. I have a grandson, he's three, and he's so smart, I said to myself, now that might be our first African-American president. But Obama, I never, ever thought I would live from the things that we experienced mm -hmm. to the, mm -mm. I, I don't know how it happened. It's a miracle. God must have been in the planning. Absolutely. And um, you were able to witness the inauguration? And able, oh, yes. I got to see all the presidents and their wives, but they booed Mr. Bush. Oh, that was terrible. It was <laughs> awful. And when they introduced Clinton and Hillary, they never wanted to stop clapping. <laughs> Is that right? No. Oh, <laughs> he, he got an ovation. Unbelievable. Thank you. Well, then, on so, that, we'll let then that be the last word then. I, pardon me? We'll let that be the last word then. Yes. And let me just once again thank you ever oh, so much welcome. for coming out and having this conversation with me. Appreciate My it. My privilege. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.